Good evening, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. And uh, we are live tonight. I know we've been having archives for the last month while I was gone, but we are live. This is March the 16th, 2012. And I hope, uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm here anyway. I just got back from a very long trip on the other side of the world, and I'm still getting over jet lag. So I'm hoping my mind is going to cooperate with me tonight. You know, every time I come back from these long trips, it takes a while to adjust. And you still, your body doesn't know where it is for quite a while. So if I fumble up, at least you'll understand. All right. Uh, but we did just return from uh, China, and that's what I want to talk tonight about is the trip to China that we had. And I have on the line the, one of our employees that works for us at our uh, England office. She's been on here before, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Hello. How are you? Uh, you got over. You had a couple more days, so you got over jet lag already, haven't you? I'm, I'm pretty good now. Yes, it does take a little while. Oh, I know because I just got back yesterday. And I slept around the clock until this morning. So I think I'm mostly back anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we'll make some sense out of this. But we started out on this trip. It's been a month ago in the middle of February. And for such a long trip, I had to go to Shanghai. And such a long trip like that, we like to break it up. So I had a class in Los Angeles. And then um, it was a big class there, too, and it was very successful. And then we went from there to Kona, Hawaii, and had a class there. You know, we're getting gradually closer to Asia that way without having to make those long 16-hour flights. So we had the class in Kona, which was also very successful. Then on to um, Shanghai. Julia went with me as far as uh, Kona. And then she turned around and came back to America. <laughs> and so I had to go on the rest of the way. And Stephanie came from the opposite direction, flying in from London and joining me when I got to Shanghai. So it was a little complicated, but we met each other that way. <laughs> but um, one thing we found with these classes and I don't know why we didn't think about it before. I've been doing the classes for 10 years now, and they've always been, worked well. But um, one of the things we found was that after the class, a lot of the students are always afraid to go out and practice the technique, the procedure. Uh, they're always afraid to take that first step. What if I fail? What if I can't do it? And... Um, so they hold off even from working with their family. Or if they try it on their family, then they're afraid to go out and try it with anybody else, especially strangers. So that's been the problem. So this time, on these three classes, we changed the way we're doing it now. A three-day class is now five days, and we're allowing time in there where they have to practice. This is part of the class. They don't have a choice. They have the one day after they've taken, we've given them all the instructions that they have to go and practice on each other. And we join them up in groups so that they will be practicing on strangers, on people they don't know. And we found this to be highly successful. And we had a tremendous success rate with the people who took all three classes. We said, well, I, we don't know why we didn't think of it before. But we thought of it, but we couldn't figure out exactly how to do it. So now I think we've got it pretty well perfected. So we're going to be doing all of our classes this way from now on. And you have instant feedback if they're having any problems. And it has been really good. So this is the way we're doing it now. And I uh, went on to Shanghai not knowing what was going to happen there. It's always harder when you have translators because they take longer anyway. Like when we go to Russia, 
the class turns into two more days longer because of the back and forth translation. So we didn't know what was going to happen in this case. But I do want to report something that happened on my way there uh, as I stopped in Tokyo in the airport just to change planes. I was in the lounge and um, I was just getting something to eat and sitting at a table in the lounge in the Tokyo airport and I felt the floor begin to vibrate as though it was moving up and down and shaking. And I saw the table was moving, a little round table, and my drink on the table, the water was slushing all over in the water, in the glass. This went on for maybe a minute. And I was thinking, are we having an earthquake? But also, you know, we're at the airport, maybe it's the airplanes that are causing the vibration. But then it stopped, and I looked around, and nobody else seemed to have noticed anything. So when I got ready to leave, I talked to one of the people that uh, run the lounge there, and I said, do we have an earthquake about five minutes ago? As I described what was happening, if the floor was moving or everything, or was it the airplanes? They said, no, we have earthquakes all the time here in Japan. And it was an earthquake, so... <laughs> But nobody else didn't be, seemed to be able to pay any attention to it. And they said, were you scared? You know, And I said, no, I've been in them before. I just wanted to be sure it was an earthquake and not just the airplanes. So that was an interesting way to start that trip anyway. So it shows they're having a minor ones, I guess, there all the time. At least it wasn't as bad as the one last year because this was almost you know, the one-year anniversary of the big one they had last year when they had the big earthquake that caused the tsunami and the nuclear disaster. So it was just a funny incident anyway that I wanted to pass on. But then we, we went on, I went on to Shanghai, and I had no idea it was going to be so cold there. Here we'd just been in Hawaii where it was hot, and then to go there, and I only brought a light jacket with me. Now, I went on the Internet beforehand to find out what was going to be the weather on these trips. It said it was going to be in the 50s, and it was going to be nice, so I thought it was going to be okay. Well, folks, you can't trust the Internet all the time. <laughs> when we got there, it was cold. Everybody is wearing winter coats. And I just had my light jacket on. Well, we had a, a wonderful uh, person that brought me over there. Li Ping met me at the airport. And from her emails, I thought that she could speak better English. But um, it ended up that she couldn't speak English that well. So I was beginning to wonder what this was going to be like. Because they said the majority of the people there don't speak English. Yeah, Stephanie, we found that out, didn't we? <laughs> we did, but we were very lucky because we had a great translator, Leo, didn't we? Yeah, but we went off by ourselves, too. And, you know, we said the cab that drivers don't speak any English. And <laughs> <laughs> Well, we one thing over there, in any foreign the cab, country, you use a lot of body language. <laughs> yes, that's so true. We did do that, didn't we? And we also yeah, realized then, that we needed to I would have say a smile goes a long way, too, and everybody <laughs> understands those kind of things. But um, I was in the hotel before Stephanie got there, so I didn't, we didn't have a translator, though, until we got to the class. But even from the beginning, it's quite an adventure. With me, it was the food. Now, Stephanie lived in... Uh, China for two years. Why don't you tell them about that? So I thought you would be more prepared for all of this. Tell them about when you used to live there. Well, I en enjoyed my time in China, but it was um, a very, very busy place. And I actually, it was um, Taiwan, but it, it gave me a very, very good idea of, of the culture and the, and the language and and how it was there. And so, yes, I was prepared for you know, things like um, the language and, and how to get around in a taxi and the food, which I did enjoy, but uh, that's always an adventure too. So I do love adventures, which is good. <laughs> this was yeah. an adventure. It was but, an adventure, wasn't it? We had some adventures, didn't we, trying to find 
TGI Fridays, we ended up somewhere quite different. And then the, the taxi took us to the wrong hotel, but we had a wonderful tour around Shanghai. It was very, very uh, cheap because the taxis were cheap. But and Stephanie, the wonderful lights. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie taught English in Taiwan for two years, I, didn't you? I did. I taught English there. I was uh, supervising the English teachers at the university there and, and writing the programs. And so I used to uh, deal with the foreign teachers and, and also teach myself. Um, and uh, that that was a really really fun thing to do. It was a great way to to meet uh, you know lots of people. It was great. Okay, they just said we have a caller, but um, I always thought because Stephanie lived over there, she would have learned Chinese. But she said oh. no. When you're teaching English, you want the students to speak in English. So yes, she didn't learn true. much. And more. and because it's such a it, <laughs> we learn so much from from written from from seeing things. Um, because I never sat and had a lesson. Unfortunately, I didn't learn, but I did learn how to direct a cab, a cab driver and, and tell them, you know, right, left, straight ahead, and slow down. So that was important, <laughs> and I learned my address <laughs> and okay. a few other bits and pieces. <laughs> I learned um, the basics. Uh, Don, did you say there's a caller? Well, I thought they interrupted there. We'll just keep on going. Usually there's a beep when there's going to be a caller online. Okay. Is there a caller? Well, okay, let's go ahead and take that before we proceed in any way then. Okay. Uh, is somebody online? Yes. Hi. This is Claudia from San Francisco. How are you? Fine. Well, I said we're still under jet lag, but I'm back here in the body anyway. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Well, you have a question? All- Yes, I do, and I'm so thankful for all the knowledge that um, you give us. I just recently um, learned about you and your work, and my friend um, let me borrow your latest book, The Three Waves of Volunteers, and I'm in total shock. Um, it's even difficult to speak um, because I believe that I'm a first wave, and I'm having a very hard time, and I don't know what to do. I don't want to be here anymore, and I relate to everything that's in this book, and I feel so great, and I, uh, I'm crying not out of sadness, but out of pure joy and emotion that I was able to get this information. But um, I don't, I don't know what, what what to do, and I really, um, I've had a, it's been very difficult, and everything. I'm sorry, I'm not babbling. Every, everything about my life made sense once I read this book, and how I felt my entire life. And um, I, I don't know what to do. Um, and I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> I know it's a loaded question. <laughs> well, I know. This is what we're running to all over the world now, yeah. you know, because everybody is finally discovering they do have a purpose. Because I got yeah. to get emails from everywhere saying, I thought I was the only one in the world that felt like this. And now they understand yeah. there's hundreds of thousands of people out there who are members of the third, the volunteers of the third wave. And yeah. uh, they realize now they're here for a reason. But it's so difficult to be here. And now more than ever, because everything in my life has dissolved, has gone away. So um, my marriage, my work, um, at the end of the month I'm going to lose my home. Um, and I'm not, it doesn't bother me. It's, it's not that I'm, you know, the, these things, you know, they are hard, but what I'm saying is it's, it's very hard for me to be in this reality. It's very hard for me to watch and observe. Um, and even though I, I do believe that I am a first wave and that I'm, and that I, all I have to do, so basically all I have to do is just to be here. There's nothing that I need to do. I understand that. But it's hard, it's so difficult for me to be in this reality. And when I hear, um, you know, the other people, um, when you took them back and they explain all these other different dimensions or realms, that sounds, it's like I'm reading something that I already knew. It's like I'm reading something about where I'm from, you know, and, and yeah. I don't want to suffer anymore. Sorry. Well, see, this is what we hear all the time. It's the same thing, that uh, yeah. people do identify with this, but it is good that now at least they're finding out what it is. Uh, well, we're going to go back to the other program in a minute, but 
when in our in one of my classes, I think it was the one we just did in in L.A. No, it was one in Hawaii. There was a man there who was in a wheelchair. He was a young man, and uh, he's paraplegic. And he told us his story, and it was very obvious that he was one of the the probably first or second waves. And he didn't want to be here. And you know, many try to commit suicide to get out, which is not the way to do it. And he said he had tried to commit suicide, oh, two or three times, and it didn't work. Well, you know, naturally, you're, if you know, you're not going to get out of this, you volunteered to come in for it. But he kept trying, and it didn't work. And he said it wasn't anything that bad. He just didn't like it here. He didn't want to be here. He didn't like the emotions. Yeah. So finally, yeah. one night, he took a gun, and he shot himself of... Oh, well, not in the stomach, higher than the stomach. And what it did, he said, right as he was pulling the trigger, he heard this loud voice yelling, no, at him. And, of course, later he said, I can't figure out what that voice was. And I said, you know what it was. It was your guides, you know, saying, no, you can't do this. But he shot himself, and it didn't kill him, but it severed the spinal cord and turned him into a paraplegic. But he said his life has turned around, even though it's much worse now. He said, everything that I was trying to get away from, I've had to face anyway. And I said, yeah, and then you dumped all of this other on top of it, happened to be in a wheelchair. But he seemed so happy. He was such a happy person because now he figured out, well, why I'm here. And I made it harder for myself, but yet I'm here for a reason. So, you know, I meet these people all the time. That's a drastic case, but uh, I've had others that try to get out for the wrong reason. And you're yeah. only here for this short time to help lead others into the new world to raise the vibrations and the frequency by your energy. So it's a very important job just to be here. Yeah. Does that help any? <laughs> It, yes, it does. I, I do understand, and I, I hope I find it, it's been very difficult. And now more than ever, when I, when I read your book, it just it put it, it, it made me understand. I don't know. I, it, it's too bad. You know, we don't have enough time today, and I won't get too much into it. I thank you so much, and I will continue to read your book and um, other books just to you know to get more insight into this. But I'm so thankful that I got to speak to you today. And um, I will continue to listen to your program. Okay, but just remember, you're here for a reason, and everything happens for a reason. It's all for a lesson to learn from. All these things that are happening in your life right now, try to see what they're teaching you and what lessons you can learn. That way they're not adversities. They're really uh, important. They're teaching you something, and your life will turn for the better. I promise you it will. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. And thank you. Okay, so I guess uh, that was interesting, wasn't it, Stephanie? Oh, we had a few of those in China too, didn't we? So that's what I was going to say. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I gave my lecture when I got to China. Uh, We had about three hundred people in that room. And I was amazed because I didn't know that they would even know my work over there. But well, they, uh, they told us they came all from all China over China that, to Shanghai they? for that lecture. Mm-hmm. And uh, from the questions they were asking, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. So to show, it shows me that these volunteers, when they came in, are coming into all of the countries all over the world. So it's not just here in America. Mm-hmm. Or we get them in Europe, too, don't we? UK, and every time I lecture over there, too. That's right. So yeah. it's really wonderful to see just how this work is, is really traveling around the world, and it doesn't matter where you're from or who you are. We're all one, and, and the world needs our help at the moment, and everybody's help at the moment. That's the important thing. But mm-hmm. uh, I was just a little amazed because... Um, You know, I didn't see that in Russia, but I think that's because over there they're still frightened about the idea of 2012 and the end of the world. But I was surprised when I heard it in China that 
But it's the same feelings, the same expressions from the people. And all, all of them were saying they just found me on the Internet. And uh, That was a big surprise, wasn't it? Because we, I do know that there are some websites that can't be accessed in China, and yet they, they found your work. So um, it doesn't seem to matter. You know, your work is, is just everywhere, and, and if it's meant to be found, it, it'll be found by people. And, and it's certainly been um, just amazing to see how deeply affected people were and and they flew in from everywhere all around China just to see that that lecture and then we had almost 80 people in the class which was wonderful and they also came from all over China Mm, they did yes yeah well our translator we had the first time I met him was at the lecture he was a delightful young man he was a nice person (laughs) his name was Leo and he had never been out of China, but uh, he told us me a lot about China because I wanted to know about these people and, uh, you know, get away from the misconceptions that we have of that country. But he was with us the whole time we were there, and we needed him because even in the hotel, the people uh, they couldn't understand English and uh, it, uh, he was like on my lifeline. He was my voice in, in the class and the lectures <laughs> anyway. I mean, he well, literally was your voice, wasn't he? And, and we know he, we, he was doing a good job because when you said something to make the English speakers laugh, he would translate and then the Chinese people would laugh as well. So he was doing a wonderful job and we could see what a job he was doing because all the students were able to come back and report the great work that they'd experienced from from doing the hypnosis. And so we know that he was doing a wonderful job and and really communicating your message so well to them. And he was doing it as a volunteer, and he came from Beijing. Mm. But his English was excellent. And, uh, of course, it always makes the class take longer with this back and forth. I was surprised we did have some uh, other people uh, I don't know what you call us. I guess you call us Westerners. Yes, that's <laughs> You know, right. they read the ones mm-hmm. that are not Chinese. We had a few, mm-hmm. and most of those came from Australia. And that's we right. Had one that man was a big surprise. To... Yes, yeah. And one was Australian. from Hong Kong, <laughs> but they don't, didn't speak Chinese, and I think it might have been confusing for them to have the back and forth of translation taking longer because they were getting the English and the Chinese. I said, you should have taken a class where it was all English, you know. <laughs> but a lot of well, them didn't want to more wait. opportunities weren't there. And we had, well, I never did find out what happened to these four. There were four young women who came from Japan. They didn't know English and they didn't know Chinese. And That's they right. were sitting they were having... at one roll together, yeah. uh, but they had their own translator. Mm. Uh, uh, was she doing it through the earphones? Yes, she was. She was doing the simultaneous. She was. Um, she had just done uh, level two, and uh, so she'd been practicing for quite some time and having some very good results herself uh, in Japan. Um, uh-huh. But her English was good, so she could translate to me and also to them, uh, which was great. So I, I do wish that them well, and I hope that they go back to Japan and do some wonderful work too because I never did get to talk to them afterwards to see if uh, if it made sense to them. Mm. And, well, you it certainly made I, sense to the Chinese people, didn't it? Well, yeah, I did, which amazed me, because a lot can be lost in translation, especially when you're into a topic like this. It's hard to understand anyway. But even in the lecture, they all seemed to get it. The questions were not that strange that they asked. No, the questions were pretty much the same as what we would get anywhere, really. So it, it, this is the power of the Internet, because they're getting all their information from the same place. And so yeah, it, it's yeah, really I would have, uh, In my other lectures, I'd have people in the States where they would, didn't understand the basics. They didn't understand a lot of metaphysics or reincarnation or any of that. So they had to, like starting from the beginning, and the questions were rather simple. But now, since the Internet explosion, and that's been about a year, over a year ago now, uh, when I've been going to the lectures, they all say they just found me. 
And since that's happened with the Internet, we're getting people who are um, more knowledgeable, I guess you would say, about metaphysics and about these strange subjects. But a lot of them are the young ones, too, that are coming in. I'm actually surprised at how, how young people are that are, are taking this up. You know, it didn't used to be that this kind of information would come to you until you were quite a lot older because it's quite advanced information and it's difficult to absorb when you're young. But I guess the young ones now are so much more aware and, and I guess the Internet really has so much to do with that now, doesn't it? And, you know, even at the lecture, about, about 300 people and they were mostly the younger generation too. That's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I'm noticing that more and more in my lectures that it's like things are changing and the younger people do have more knowledge of uh, what we're going into where it used to be just you'd have to have years and years of reading to where you could understand any of this. So I've seen some big changes since my books first came out in the 80s. I think another thing that really struck me about the, the audience that we had in China was that um, we weren't sure about the kind of level of knowledge that they would have, but they came with such a deep spiritual um, knowledge from their own background and their own culture anyway. And, and we had a lot of people speaking about ghosts and spirits and a couple of people saw dragons in their hypnosis sessions. So it was fascinating to see how this... Yes, <laughs> it was just fascinating but, to yeah, see how there, they kind yeah, of there translated. there were many it. of them that said that a lot of this goes along with the Buddhist beliefs. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. They had even had words for what I was trying to say, concepts in their Buddhist beliefs. So they did, and that really helped, didn't it? That once that lady got that word and she she said it, they were kind of like, oh, okay, so this is the same thing, right? And that was a beautiful way of communicating that that very complex idea, you know, to an audience that we weren't sure did know about this this kind of idea, but they did, it turned out. It was great. Uh-huh. And then, too, you never know, um, you know, but this is a communist country, you know, what their belief systems are there anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, I was surprised because I I was under the impression that many Chinese people haven't been allowed to have any kind of religious practice, but uh, I guess it's cultural and, and it goes back so, so long that, uh, you know, of course they've got these ideas and these beliefs, and so it was fascinating to see what they made of, of your work, but it was it was much easier to, to, you know, communicate with them and get them to understand, and the language barrier wasn't really a problem after all, it, really. It was hard for me, but... Yes. <laughs> no, but thanks, <laughs> thanks to our translator, I mean, he... He did such a wonderful, magnificent job. Yes, he absolutely did. Definitely uh, working with him again. And um, um, I couldn't do a demonstration. In my class, I always give a demonstration to show the people firsthand how this works when I do the hypnosis. And there's no way to do it whenever you're in a country like that where you have the translation back and forth. <coughs> so I had a, a demo that I'd done in another class um, that was on a DVD. So we just showed that. But uh, Leo, Leo was our translator. He stayed up even the night before to, trying to get this right. It was a DVD in English of the, the uh, session, but he put the Chinese titles, you know, the words across the screen, which was a tremendous amount of work for him to do. And... Uh, it worked. They understood this by reading it, didn't they? They did, because you could tell the reactions uh, from everybody as they were reading it um, were exactly uh, you know, what everybody else's reactions would have been if they were just listening to it in English. So uh -huh. obviously it worked, and, and they really got it, because the next day the, uh, you know, the, the demonstrations, what they were reporting was, was spot on. It was exactly as you would expect in any class that had been just... Uh, taught in English, so it uh -huh. worked really well, and, and we do have a lot to thank Leo for for doing that. He was up until two o'clock in the morning the night before translating that for us, so he d he went over and above. He was, he was fantastic. And um, but uh, they were saying there's another caller, but 
I want to finish that part. <clears throat> but then I want to do go into Shanghai and talk about that because, but yeah, the next day is when we had them go and practice, put them into groups and had them practice on each other. And we didn't know what was going to happen there. But then on the last day, they report the results. And it was uh, really astounding because, like you said, they got it. And you know what that means to a teacher to go into a place where you do know as a teacher to go in there and teach them something. You don't know if they're going to understand it. And they did, and they were also having miraculous results. And some of them, in their private sessions among each other, were finding out they were different waves. They were first and second waves. So I had to explain what that was to them also. <clears throat> and many of them were rocks and plants and all the things I've written about. So to me, that shows we are working with a very powerful force here that gives the same answers no matter where we go in the world. So this is real. And we know it's real. <clears throat> okay, did you, uh, Don, did you say there was a caller online? I heard him say there was a caller, I think. Hello, was there any caller there? Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello, Dolores. Yes, Hi, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say that you inspired me so much. Like, sorry, I'm getting emotional. I'm 18 years old, and I didn't know. Oh, what's your name, honey? My name is Caitlin. Okay. Well, well go ahead. Um, I had no idea where I came from, and you inspired me to look for myself and get over the fear of what the possibilities were. And I just wanted to thank you. And I wanted to tell <clears throat> all the other star seeds out there to look for themselves and do not be afraid. Well, at because least you all know you're not alone. That's the important thing. Yes. I feel so connected for once. Like... I'm so young to be dealing with this, but I'm dealing, and that's all that matters, that I'm able to get through this, and I'm able to move on and help other people. And, honey, and, that's what it's all about. We're all here to help each other, and that's the main thing. And we are moving into a beautiful new earth where it's going to be wonderful and mm -hmm. your energy is going to be a very important part in all of this. And you know what? Since, okay, it's only been a week for me, so I'm still processing. But already I've noticed a difference in myself, in the world. Everything feels different. Like, I see auras. I'm astral projecting in my dreams, so many different things, and I just, at first, I had a panic attack. I freaked out, and I was so scared, but there is no need to be scared. There is no need. It's all good. It's all light. It's all pure intentions. Well, you've but, got it right. You have. You understand, and believe me, things are mm -hmm. going to be wonderful. <laughs> and you're going to be a yes, very important part of it. <clears throat> okay, well, thank, thank you for so coming in. And you go <laughs> ahead and just live your life. That's what it's all about. Live your life, and everything is going to work out fine. Thank okay, you so bye -bye. much. <clears throat> okay, Stephanie, you back? Stephanie? Stephanie, are you back? Well, 
Uh, I think she's back. She's I think the other. We're going to have to bring her back. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I'm thinking, where'd she go? Okay. <clears throat> Are you back, Stephanie? Um, well, I'll keep talking until she gets back on the line anyway. I guess they, when they brought in the caller, disconnected her. But one thing I was surprised, Shanghai is the largest city in China. 60 million people in one city. <clears throat> Even Stephanie said that blew her away when she found out that many people in one city. The whole country of China has 1.7 billion people. Billion. That's a lot of people. <clears throat> they have um, the largest population in the world. So that's a lot of people to be trying to contact here. So that's why, to me, it's amazing that they're getting this. And the ones that took the class would take it out to their areas, and they're going to be practicing this technique all over China on this rate. Stephanie, are you back? Okay. But um, Shanghai is an extremely beautiful city. You know, I guess I figured from what we've heard of China that it was going to be poor people and, uh, you know, that, that the culture would be different. But it is a beautiful, modern city. The people seem prosperous. They're dressed very nice. They're driving brand new cars. And they have all the latest inventions with the cell phones and the cameras. <clears throat> and it's not at all the way I would thought it would have been, like the poor people that we've been led to, to think that China had in it. But it's this uh, beautiful, wonderful city. And it reminded me a lot of New York City with the tall skyscrapers. But at night, the city came alive, and all of the buildings were lit up in colored lights, and the lights would rotate and change and move. And it was like Christmas all the time, only much better, because tall skyscrapers with lights running up and down them. And it was just beautiful to watch it. And the river... There were boats going down the river that were all lit up with lights. So it was a really beautiful city and highly advanced city. They have everything that they need there. Steph, are, Stephanie, are you back? I guess I'm just going to have to continue talking with and to get back on when she can then. Um. Are you have a mugsy on line four? Okay, where's Stephanie? Stephanie's line is nobody's able to get through it. She's running uh, busy, so probably problem with the line. Well, she's probably holding it, I guess. Okay, well, I've only got about another 10, 15 minutes here, so I'll just keep going. Okay, go ahead and let the caller through. Hello, is there anybody there? Hi, yes. I was wondering, Dolores, if you could explain a little bit more about the world splitting apart between the new world and the old world and where you think we are today as, you know, what we're going through now and what's the next phase. Well, <laughs> that's what I do in my lectures. <laughs> it can get a little complicated. I don't want to take too long. Uh, what's your name? Just a snapshot. Okay. Well, I've explained it in my books and my lectures, and people are always asking about the splitting. You know, it's not an actual split. It means that moving into another dimension, a pulling apart, and we're advancing into another dimension, and it's the raising of the vibrations and the frequencies to go into another dimension. And so the one world is the one that's going to be evolving, because the earth itself, as a living being, is getting ready to go into its next incarnation. Because it reincarnates just the way people do, it's just that it takes it longer. 
and it's getting ready to go into the next incarnation. So it will be evolving and changing vibration and frequency to enter the new dimension. And if we want to go with it, we have to change our frequency and vibration. And the young girl had it right when she was talking about she was seeing things differently and seems things seem to be appearing differently. That shows, but I keep telling people it's not going to just happen, bam, and there's going to be a big change. It's a very gradual change, a very slow, gradual change as it happens. So you won't notice anything suddenly out of, out, out of the difference, out of the ordinary. But as we progress, it'll be gradual until you'll just start looking around and saying, things seem different, they seem better, there's something happening here. And we are, are right in the middle of all of this. We've been in the middle of it. It started about, for me anyway, about 2003, and it's been a gradual uh, process. But I can see it all over the world that it is moving and it is changing. And uh, you can't say when is it going to start because it already has started and we're, we're in the middle of it now. There's no way to turn it back. And uh, we are moving into the new world. Does that I think help? That's- yeah, uh, there's just a lot of people like your caller before that um, needed a happy thought, and they wanted it from Dolores Cannon. So I thought I would call in and ask you those questions. Thank you. Yeah, they're in the book, The Three Waves of Volunteers. It's all explained in that. And that's an accumulation of many, many years of investigations of people saying the same thing over and over. And that was what was amazing, too, in the demonstrations they were doing, even in China, they were all getting the same information without even knowing anything about my books. So it's, it's amazing. It is happening, and it's real. Okay, but it's not to be afraid, anyway. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Um. But I do want to bring up a few things before I forget to mention them. I don't know if I'll think about it next week or not, so I want to make sure I get them tonight. I had a lot of questions about the culture over there. As I said, they seem to be well-to-do. They're dressed nice. They have, uh, of course, the money is a huge difference. Everything is so much cheaper than it is here. But I wanted to know about the one-child uh, law that they had in China because both of the, my translator and the woman that brought me over had one child, and I wanted to know more about that. And it is true they're only allowed to have one child, but there are exceptions to the rule. Uh, Leo explained that if the both parents, the mother and the father, are only children in the family, they're allowed to have another child. I guess it's so you can replace yourself. But it is, uh, they said they've gotten the population now to where it is even. It's not growing anymore. It is even. It's staying stable. And it may even be beginning to go down. I said a while ago, 1.7 billion people in one country is a lot of people. And there is forced uh, contraception so that you won't, you can only have one child and that's all the way it is. But, you know, when you think about it, uh, it may sound like a terrible thing to make a per- woman so she won't have any more children, but they said they have maternity police. But think about it. What if our country reached the point where it was bursting at the seams, where you couldn't hold any more population and it was just out of control? Even our government would have to find some way to do something about it. I don't know if we would use that method or we would come up with something else, but I think it's only logical to think that we would have to come up with some way of controlling population. So when you look at it in that uh, respect, it's a matter of survival. This is what the Chinese government came up with. And, uh, well, I've been in India, and there the population is tremendous too, and they're 
living on the streets. When I was in New Delhi and Bangalore and those other big cities, they live on the streets. They're very poor. Uh, they have a sheet of metal against a building, and they're sleeping under that, begging on the streets. So it can get to the point where you have to do something. And uh, they're not doing anything in in India that I could see to control the population. But before we condemn a country for doing something we don't understand, let's put ourselves in the position of what would we do if we came to that point where we had to take action in order to survive as a, as a country, as a civilization. Another thing I thought was interesting that Leo was telling me is that um, all of the families live together. Like when you get married, uh, you bring your spouse. It's usually the husband's family. When you get married, the, the husband and the wife move in with the uh, the parents. He said they have their own bedroom, but otherwise they share the kitchen and they're all living with their family, and they don't leave. He said, in fact, it's a disgrace if the man should have to move in with the woman's family. But all the family lives together, and um, that's just the way it is. And there's children, they just all take care of them together. And... <laughs> I said, and I don't know if I'd like that idea because I've got a huge family. (laughs) I like my independence, and I like being by myself when I come back from these countries, these trips. But um, I asked him about that. Well, what about extended families? He said, oh, yes, they have as many as four generations living in one house because they just stay there, and the one generation moves in, and you've got your grandchildren living there. My case, if the grandchildren have kids and get married, they would all be living in one big house. Well, truthfully, I think I'd go crazy. <laughs> My family's too big. I wouldn't want them all under one roof. But that's uh, the culture difference there. And uh, they don't really uh, get away from that. And that's what they, Leo kept asking me, well, who takes care of you? And I said, I don't need anyone to take care of me. I take care of myself. I live alone. And he said, oh, that would never happen in China. If you were living alone, they would think you had bad children because the children have to take care of the older generation. Well, in a way, you can see here that you're not going to have very many people going into nursing homes because the families all take care of each other. So it was an interesting concept. It wouldn't work for me, and I don't think it would work for a lot of Americans, but if it works for them, that's fine. Every place I go will have different cultural differences, and that's all right. Dolores, we've got someone on the line called Alfonso who's ready to talk to you now. Okay. Are you back, Steph? I am, yes. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Gremlin's on the line there. (laughs) Yeah, we lost you, so I just kept talking anyway. (laughs) <laughs> and okay. Leo didn't tell you about that concept where all the families, as many as four generations, all live together. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I said that would not work for me. <laughs> okay, somebody on the line. We only got, I think, another five minutes at the most. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Who's online? His name is Alfonso. How you doing, Dolores? Okay, uh, what's Hello, your name? Hello, Dolores. It's Alfonso. Okay, go ahead. I have a question. Okay. So I just, um, well, I finished Convoluted 4 a little while ago, and I have a concept that's just been really perplexing to me. And you, <clears throat> I've heard you go over it briefly, but not really in detail, but the backdrop people. And that's <laughs> one that's kind of, like, I, like you, you said at the beginning of the page, you said, if this concept doesn't, you know, make you think, then I don't know what will. And the concept of the backdrop people is really intriguing to me. So if you could, just do it. I mean, just go into it for a little bit. In, in these briefs, I know you have like five minutes left, so can you just go into it really quickly? Well, have you read my other convoluted books? Yes, ma'am. I've actually read all of your convoluted. I've just finished The Custodians. I've read Keepers of the Garden. And after I get done with Finishing up the custodians, I'm going to read the two Jesus books. Okay. So, well read. 
because I was thinking, you know, each convoluted book gets a little more and a little more complicated, and we come up with different ideas and concepts in each book, and they just seem to get more and more complicated. So in this book, I was thrown this idea of the backdrop people, and it is a complicated concept, and I know I don't have all the information. I know it's going to be, uh, it's hard for me to understand, so I know they will give me more information about it. But, you know, they say everything is illusion anyway. It's all an illusion and nothing is real. We're just actors on the stage anyhow. So they said if you're like actors in your own play or your own movie, you always cast uh the backdrop people, the ones who are the extras that just fill in the scene. <clears throat> so they said, well, that concept, most of the people you see on the streets and around you in the stores and all of that aren't even real. So, I mean, that's a real mind bender. <laughs> and when yeah, I'm in like, a crowded like airport, pocket. I have been this last uh, couple of weeks, I keep looking at all these people thinking, hmm, they're all backdrop people. They're not really there. <laughs> But you know, I've said that about the Yeah, I said what? Just uh, thinking about that just kind of makes you like all the people just even looking at the news and just thinking about some of the events that you you kind of see and say, "Wow, I wonder what's going on." With those people is it really? Wow, like they're just. I'm just saying, like that's the that's the that's one of the most perplexing complex. I mean, concepts I've come across with backdrop people. And that just that <laughs> well, one makes you think so. Uh, thank you I, I know I'm going to get more information on it, but see, that's what I said in my books. I said, uh, you know, don't take all, any of this seriously. Treat it as mind candy, something to read and enjoy and try to understand. But then, you know, then we have to put the book aside and go on with our daily lives. But they're interesting concepts, and that's what it's all about. That's why I call the book for those who want their minds spent like pretzels. Throw an idea out and just see if you can understand it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I know I'm going to get more information because every time I get something like that, they'll keep on giving me more until I can understand it. Okay, well, we're going to have to let you go because I'm coming up to the top of the hour here. <laughs> but I know I couldn't explain it any better, but it's something to think about anyway. Okay, so thank you, Dolores. Okay, and thank you for calling. Okay, Stephanie, we're getting up to the top of the hour where he's going to have to pull the plug on us. We only just we, got started. I know. <laughs> that's what the hour flies by so fast, especially when you have interesting callers. Before yeah. we go, I do want to make one interesting story that uh, when I, after I left Shanghai, I went to Singapore, and we had a level two class in Singapore. The only way I could do it was to tack it on the end of the trip. I just went in there for one day and got out of there. But, Stephanie, they had the most fascinating story that one of my students told in the Level 2 class. Um, you know, in, in Singapore, they have the cockatoos, the birds. Yeah. Well, she said right before they were getting ready to do the session in this woman's house, a cockatoo flew into the, the glass of the window and knocked itself out. So they went out to check on it to see if it was all right, and, it, it, of course, you know, knocked itself unconscious. I've had birds do that here where we live. So they brought the cockatoo inside and laid it on the floor so it could revive itself, so that way predators wouldn't get it. Then they went into the bedroom and started to have the session. And they had hardly begun the session when they heard a knocking at the bedroom door. <laughs> so she opens the door. There's a cockatoo standing at the door. <laughs> and it, it walks in the room. And I kept thinking later, can a cockatoo knock on a door? <laughs> oh, yes, they can. They're very cheeky. And the student said, well, I guess he did it with his beak. But exactly. he knocks on the door. She opens the door, walks in flies up on the bed, sits on the woman's chest, and lays there the whole time of the session. Oh, my goodness. I think goodness. that's amazing. <laughs> well, we got so good. wanted to, to either have some healing or maybe also give some healing as well. Yeah. 
I've had cats do that, but I never heard of a bird doing it. No, okay, but yeah, so you're smart, gonna have to though. pull the plug, aren't you, Don? Uh yep, yep, ladies, we're gonna have to close it out. Okay. Anyway, everyone, I appreciate you listening tonight. And thanks, everyone, and goodbye. Stephanie, you say bye from England. (laughs) Thank you, and bye from England. Thanks a lot, everybody, and thanks, Dolores. Bye. And I'll be live next week. Okay, good night, everyone. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.